Thank you. So um, when we started talking about this, we started thinking about deep adaptation, which is now not in the title at all, which now says what's in the Christian spiritual tradition that can help us build community in a type of economic and social collapse. But economic and social collapse is very much what deep adaptation is about. So I'm going to start off by just saying a really little bit about that. I'm guessing that most of you have come across it or know about it already. But just in case you haven't, deep adaptation is um, an idea that comes from a paper and a book by a guy called Jem Bendel. And it's well worth a read if you haven't seen it. Deep adaptation has become an international movement, but in the the book and the paper, Jem Bendel talks about, in really basic terms, the things that will need to change about the way that we live in the face of economic and societal breakdown and the part that community plays within that. So he talks about the things that we will need to learn, and he has four main headings. And they're actually really good Christian values. So he talks about resilience. What do we most value that we want to keep? And how do we go about keeping it? He talks about relinquishment and what we need to let go of so that we don't make things worse. And um, it's that that really strikes me as something that the, the church throughout the ages has sat with as things have changed. So, you know, the big things like the Reformation, but also little things like fresh expressions of church and such like. So resilience, relinquishment, restoration. What could we bring back that we've maybe lost to help us in difficult times? And then reconciliation. With what and with whom shall we make peace as we awaken to our mutual mortality? Lots of um, really Christian stuff going on there really ties in with uh, with repentance and and Lent. So what we're going to look at this morning is how different Christian monastic streams, all of which have contemplation as part of their tradition, have something to offer in us learning how to build resilient community. And I am hoping that I'm going to share some photos and Jonathan is going to kick us off with some talk. So while the photos are coming up, ap apologies for not showing my face, but I've got a strobe effect going on. Uh, so, yeah, three, I suppose, key ingredients of, of community, building resilient community, uh, we've chosen to look at today i i reckon there are six or seven I, i'm i'm trying to write a book about it eventually um but the three we've chosen today are humility boundaries and celebration and uh we kind of paired them with a monastic tradition so humility I reckon goes well with the little sisters, little brothers of Jesus. Boundaries goes well with the Benedictine tradition. And celebration, we've plumped for the uh, Franciscan tradition. So to begin with the uh, humility, Bernard of Clairvaux, a Cistercian uh, from the Middle Ages, wrote, no spiritual house can stand for a moment, save on the foundation of humility. And of course, we are a people of the earth. As humans, we're dependent for our, our survival on that, those few inches of topsoil, that thin layer of uh, humus, not the thing you eat, but humus, that uh, lovely crumbly fertile soil but uh, our arrogance and certain theologies of domination and subjugation of nature are really a major cause 
of climate breakdown. Building always bigger. Uh, Joanna Macy talks about the industrial growth machine, doesn't she? Uh, these, uh, you know, the whole you know, economic bent uh, on economic growth, growth, we must have growth, uh, has cost us so much. Uh, I think we need to, uh, of course, re repent of this. And uh, Gandhi comes up when he's thinking about uh, nonviolence with the term ahimsa, which really comes is about a sense of, of humility and living peacefully uh, and gently on the earth. Um, of course, many CCA actions do involve sitting on the ground. Uh, yeah, being close to the earth. There's a basic level of humility here, isn't there? Uh, Nonviolence in so many ways uh, is about humility, not a humility that um, rolls over, that's passive, uh, but non nonetheless is humble, is respectful. And of course, the Lenten call to repentance is all about humbling ourselves before the mighty hand of God. Dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. Repent and believe in the gospel, we say on Ash Wednesday. Uh, th this is a shot from uh, um, Falmouth, from G7. I was just amazed to see a, a, a XR um had asked for a hundred people to be penitent and dress in sackcloth and ashes and it it just felt the um xr had has so much a better sense of corporate repentance humility than 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 the church uh felt almost like they'd stolen our ground and and jesus of course doesn't cling to equality with God in the letter to Philippians, but empties himself, humbles himself. Uh, Joan Chittister, a Benedictine sister, writes this. Vulnerability binds us to one another and makes us a community in league with life. A community in league with life. I love that. Because we need another, because we need one another, we live looking for good in others, without which we ourselves cannot survive. We will not grow, cannot become what we have the potential to be. Vulnerability, or you could say humility, she says, is the gift given to us to enable us to embed ourselves in the universe and in the uh, the Christian tradition uh, I think the kind of and the monastic tradition the people who I feel perhaps show the most humility are the little sisters little brothers of Jesus there's a uh, lovely picture of uh, Charles de Foucault the, the the founder and they always live in the uh, choose to live in very small communities in the poorest neighborhoods around the world and don't have any great programs but simply live alongside uh, uh, the poorest people in our world lovely story of brother ian in uh, who was a little brother in peckham before peckham started to become gentrified um he said there was so much housebreaking in his area. He just put a sign up on his wind, uh, window of his front door saying, protected by poverty, because he didn't even bother locking his door because uh, people knew he, he, he lived so simply, he had nothing. So that's the first 
bit of the tradition, humility. Second area what we could look at is boundaries, uh, rhythms. That's a, that's a rather arty shot of a, a fence post uh, deline delineating a boundary. I think the genius of the monastic tradition is that it provides a safe container to allow people to flourish, to be transformed. Uh, there's a bell at Hillfield Friary. That kind of sounds out. That's the warning bell 10 minutes before uh, it rings. You can hear it from two miles away, um, resonating, bouncing off the hills. Uh, that's a 10 minute warning bell that there's going to be prayers. And that'll sound out four times a day. And, and so in the monastic tradition, the um, the, the day is broken up. Uh, into firstly times of prayer, times for times for eating. For us at Hillfield Priory, it's four times a day. If you're a Benedictine, it's seven times a day. If you're a Muslim, it's five times a day. Uh, and I think as you know, as people, as children growing up, we need we need boundaries to know where we are. And I think as a society, we need boundaries. But, you know, neoliberalism and ultra liberalism, ultra individualism, sorry, uh, really is against setting boundaries. Uh, big corporations don't want limits. They don't want boundaries. They don't want to be held to account. Uh, I guess this is a river somewhere in Asia, but it could so easily just be the River Wye, couldn't it? Or one of so many uh, rivers in this country. Uh, yet the Lent fast challenges this narrative of consumption. Uh, do we really always need more? And what's wrong with rationing? What's wrong with rationing? Uh, why can't we have rationing? Um, it was apparently really popular uh, amongst the majority of people, perhaps not the the, the wealthiest, but uh, during the Second World War, uh, much more egalitarian rationing. And uh, yeah, we all need containing to give us our trespasses. Jesus uh, tells us we need to know our limits as a society, as as people. Uh, well, what about um, what about breaking the law? What about breaking the law? Surely, that's about breaking boundaries which are set there for our protection. I always tell the police when I I'm arrested how grateful I am that I live in a society where there is law and order. And I've always been grateful on a, a few occasions. Uh, we used to have to do it once or twice a year when I was at Pilsen Community. Uh, we had to call the police when somebody was being usually drunk or very disruptive and that we couldn't move them on. We called the police. Uh, and when we break the law, I think we need to do it seriously uh, and after, you know, considerable thought, but also with humility. And uh, boundaries are perhaps best illustrated in the monastic tradition through the rule of Benedict, Benedictine spirituality. Uh, Benedict, of course, was uh, around in the sixth century when the Roman Empire was uh, disintegrating. Um, of course, uh, the empires of today are disintegrating. Back in the 80s, I think Alistair Mackandar uh, famously wrote that uh, we, in his book After Virtue, we need a new St. Benedict. Uh, and that was in the, that was in the 70s. How much more do we need uh, 
Christian communities that can um, can show, uh, you know, disciplined, uh, joyful ways to live. And living in containment and balance, uh, in my experience, leads us to joy. And Hillary's now going to go on and speak a little bit about um, that um, that dynamic. So it's really easy, I think, to be um, very serious about uh, about our religion, about our faith, and especially during Lent, yeah. it's um, <clears throat> it's meant to be a time of reflection, isn't it? A time of repentance, self examination, perhaps. But um, even within Lent. The, the the Lenten fast, if you're doing something like that, is suspended on Sundays because Sunday is still a day of celebration, isn't it? Because um, the resurrection of Jesus is is the most important thing. Sunday remains a day of celebration, and I think that in community within the depths of the climate crisis, it's really important to give ourselves that space to celebrate. So I was interested looking at the um, the program for next weekend when some of us are going to be together as Christian Climate Action, that we start with a time of looking back on the last year. And I find myself wondering what part celebration is going to play in that, because so often we review things. And we, we sometimes focus on the, the things that have not gone the way that we wanted them to rather than what's been good. So I was looking through some of my pictures and wondering if we're going to celebrate a very soggy day outside BAE systems or various bits of sitting and praying and worshipping on roads or next to roads, challenging government. Are we going to celebrate that whether it's made a difference or not, but celebrate it as being something good. It's really important that we do celebrate things no matter how big or how small. The word celebration I have recently discovered comes from a Latin root that means to gather in order to honor. So the attitude of celebration is rooted in being together and honouring what God has done, rather than what we see as not happening yet. But it has to be shared. The implication is that celebration has to be done in community. And I think we all instinctively understand this, because I'm pretty sure that most, if not all of us, at some point, will have had good news to share. And the first thing we do is go and find someone else with whom to share it, whether that's calling somebody on the phone, finding somebody in the house, or even um, just sharing a picture of something beautiful on Facebook. So um, a small celebration from the end of my summer last year was my amazement at finding the stem of a bramble that looks exactly like a fruit salad chew. Um, I shared it on Facebook just because it gave me such joy to have discovered it that I wanted to, to share it, an unexpected joy. And um, looking at the Franciscan tradition, I think that um, Francis was really good at this, finding joy in the smallest of things and often in situations where we might not see that there was even joy or celebration to find. So that there's a, a story in um, the book of the, the, the Little Flowers of, of St. Francis. I won't read you the whole story because it's, it's quite long. But um, Francis was out walking one day with Brother Leo, who was one of the, the first of his, his brothers to join him. And it was a really cold winter's day, thoroughly unpleasant. They're, they're wearing sandals and, and simple robes, so they're not particularly cosy. And Francis starts talking to Leo about joy. And he says, um, brother, even if the friars are an example of holiness in the whole world, there is no joy in that. And then a bit later, he says, and even if we could heal the sick and make the dead rise after four days, 
that the source of joy is not in that either. Brother Leo says nothing. I guess he's thinking about quite hard. And Francis goes on. If the friars had wisdom and knowledge of everything in the world, there is no joy in this. Leo still says nothing. But if eventually Leo shouts out, please, Father Francis, tell me where joy is to be found. Well, they're, they're on a journey to somewhere where they, they hope they're going to stay. And Francis says, when we arrive at our destination and we are soaked by the rain, chilled to the bone, drenched with mud and very hungry, but we get turned away from the gates and may, maybe even beaten with sticks. If we bear all this with patience, receive the insults with joy and charity, then this is the source of joy because we bear all of this in as much as we bear the suffering of Jesus Christ. We bear it all because we love him. I'm not sure that I'm very good at, um, at finding joy in cold, muddy walks and then being turned away at the end of it. But it is something that Francis and the Franciscan tradition has to teach us about celebration, finding joy and celebrating in maybe odd places, perhaps like a, a simple piece of bramble or the beauty of frozen water droplets on barbed wire, not something that you usually see as something to celebrate perhaps. The, the beauty that's in even nature dying in the garden and then sharing it to create celebration. It's really got something in common with Ignatian spirituality, which talks about finding God in all things. That is the top of a stinging nettle in the summer, just amazingly beautiful and certainly something to, to celebrate about the world. And where Ignatian spirituality talks about finding God in all things, you know, why, why would you not celebrate when you've connected with God? I'm um, going to read a little bit from something else that was written about Francis. So um, this is by someone called Th Thomas of Celano, who wrote a lot about St. Francis. It's almost impossible to describe how great was the affection of Francis for all of God's creation, the depth of his joy in contemplating the wisdom, the power and the goodness of their creator in all creatures. It was with this joy that he looked upon the sun, beheld the moon and gazed upon the stars. He saw their creator even in the little worms, which he would pick up from the road and put down in a safe place, lest they be trampled. For he remembered that it had been said of his Lord, I am a worm and no man. In winter, he provided the bees with honey, lest they freeze. He had a special love of flowers. He preached to them and invited them to praise the Lord as though they could understand. He urged the cornfields, the vineyards, the stones and the forests and everything green, gardens, fountains and fields, earth, fire, wind and water, to love God and serve him willingly. He invited all creation to imitate the youths in the fiery furnace and praise and glorify the creator of the universe. Filled with the spirit of God, he never ceased to glorify, praise and bless in all creation, the creator and ruler of all things. He called all creatures brother and in an extraordinary way unknown to each to others, his sensitive heart uncovered the hidden things of the world. It was as though he were already enjoying the freedom of the glory of the sons of God. So. Why celebrate? In Philippians, again, Philippians 4.4, 4, it says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. But if you look at that translation in the message, it says, celebrate God all day, every day. When we find ourselves, as many of us have, in a low place because all this seems like too much or it seems like we're not making any difference, Finding small joys like a beautiful green path, turning them into celebration through sharing them with others is part of what gives us strength to carry on doing what we do. 
So the importance of celebration, looking forward to some of it next weekend. And I'm going to hand back to Jonathan to wind up and introduce some questions for breakout rooms. I hope I am. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Looking for the questions. Uh, I think they were what, um, yeah, two we'll give you two questions for the breakout room. What kind of, is there anything that struck you or connected with you, uh, connected with your heart, particularly in the presentation? And uh, another question would be really, yeah, what what builds community for you where you are, and what what in the Christian tradition, yeah, inspires um, community? 